Let's see what paper two had in store for, has in store for us. Okay, question one. Um, you need to work through your multis as quickly as you possibly can. It says various options are provided for possible answers. These are just multi-choices. You all know that you've done thousands of them by the time you get to matric. So look at this one. Which one of the following may result in Down syndrome in humans? Okay, so is it a gene mutation? Definitely not. Is it the failure of chromosome pair 21 to separate during anaphase 2? One, yes, it is. Okay, why? Because Down syndrome is caused by disjunction. Okay, and when disjunction happens, everything's perfect. But when we have non disjunction, we end up with an extra copy of chromosome number. 21. So therefore, this child will then have 47 chromosomes instead of the normal 46. And we say that when there are three copies, it is called trisomy. So it's not a gene mutation, okay? It's not anything to do with the gonosomes because your gonosomes are your sex chromosomes, the X and the Y. Um, and it's not a gene mutation we've already established, and it's definitely not an X chromosome. So it is the failure of chromosome pair 21 to separate during anaphase 1 and for the chromosomes to separate during anaphase 2. So just remember that for future. Okay. Then variation within a species is introduced through what? Well, You've got random mating and asexual reproduction. That is correct. That is incorrect. Because variation doesn't come from asexual reproduction. Um, remember, with sexual reproduction, you've got the, 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 the genetic makeup of the male and the female, and they combine, so there's variation, to create the offspring. Um, when it's asexual reproduction, it is, it is a form of mitosis, which we then say we call binary fission. It's the way bacteria uh, um, multiply. Okay, so we know mitosis, it is not. Random fertilization is correct. Random mating is correct. Random fertilization is correct. And meiosis also causes variation. So which of these has two ticks? It is C. All right, now, African apes and humans are similar. You must make sure, guys and girls, that you know the characteristics that are shared by African apes and, 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 and humans, okay? Make sure you know what they are, what the characteristics are. And also learn, put it into a table so it's easy to learn. And also the differences between the African ape and humans. So now we're looking at the similarities. Well, humans have small jaws, okay? And a well-developed brow ridge, well, that will be our African apes. Um, opposable thumbs, that's both. And bare fingertips, yay, there's our answer. But just in case it isn't, let's go through the other options. Gaps between their teeth, that'll be African apes. And eyes in front, well, that's both of us. Then upright posture, that's humans only. Why? Because African apes on all fours. And a cranial ridge, that's your African ape. So the best answer here and the most accurate one is the opposable thumbs. This is an opposable thumb, okay, so that we can hold, we can grab. So that's an opposable thumb. Bare fingertips, you can also say uh, they don't, we, we don't, that neither apes nor us have claws. We've got nails. Um, we have a wrist that can rotate. We have an arm that can rotate. So just on the arm, you've got five, difference, uh, uh, five similarities. Okay, so easy to learn. Then the diagram below shows the tiktar, what's it, the tiktalic rosea, which is its biological name, which is a fish that may be the ancestor of the first organisms to live on land. Okay, so look, it's got sort of finnies that look a bit like legs. So according to Lamarck, this species of fish may have evolved the ability to walk on land by the following. Now, before we go any further, you have to remember that Lamarck 
um, was known for his two main laws. The one was use and disuse. So he said if an organism didn't use an organ um, or, a, or a limb or a structure, it would just disappear in the next generation. So that's use and disuse. And if you used it more while well, it developed, and then that made that took you to the second law, which was um, a, a, the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Now, acquired characteristics would be, for example, to, to just put it into perspective of what Lamarck said, um, you know Arnold Schwarzenegger, the, the Terminator, you know how well built he is, okay? Um, by Lamarck's theory, all Arnie's children come out of the womb looking like him. Um, and they will all, without any exercise or any kind of building, they will end up looking like their father, which is nonsense. We know this. He used um, a giraffe as an example. So he said the giraffe's neck got longer and longer because they stretched higher and higher to get to the um, top leaves. And they just passed that on to their next generation, which is impossible because it's not genetic. Okay, so according to Lamarck, and that's what you must remember, the law of use and disuse and his law of um, inherited acquired characteristics. Okay, and his laws were all disproved anyway. So you must look at whether it relates to Lamarck specifically. So undergoing natural genetic mutations cause the fins and the legs to, to develop, okay? It's natural genetic mutations. That's not law of use and disuse or inherited acquired characteristics, so it's wrong. The process of natural selection would cause that, but it's not according to Lamarck, so no. Passing of acquired, ah, oh, there we go, acquired characteristics of the fins to the offspring, that would be your option, but check. Stretching its fins and using them for walking, uh, the, they're still going to, but hang on, hang on, hang on. This can't be right because look at this. See, I almost did what I'm sure many of you did. Passing of the acquired characteristics, which relates to his law, but it says of fins. Well, that's got nothing to do with walking, so that one's wrong. So stretching its fins and using them for walking, that would have been according to Lamarck. Okay. Right, the diagram below shows some of the processes, the molecules, and the structures that are involved with protein synthesis in a cell. First rule is we answer, we write the label. So this label here is, it could be a structure, it could also be a process, so that would be DNA, even before looking at the question, okay? And what happens here? In the nucleus, we are going to have trans that is when the DNA makes RNA. And translation is when RNA makes amino acids. Right, so two, well, that's the nucleus. And wow, if you didn't know that, well, we have a problem. Three is your messenger RNA, because it's the messenger RNA that is coded for by the DNA. Uh, this here would be your transfer RNA. There's a mitochondria, and there your Golgi apparatus, etc. Okay, so let's see what the question asks. And it says, which one of the following is the correct label for one, two, and three? Now we know for sure two is the nucleus, so that makes it C or D. And we know that that is what a tRNA looks like. This is our mRNA. So even if you didn't know what one was, we definitely know that, a that, a, that two is a nucleus and three is the mRNA, but we do know that it was transcription or the DNA, and the answer is C. A homozygous purple plant, which means that plant would be capital P, capital P, is crossed with a pink flowering plant. So this pink plant is going to be little p, little p, although you can't see the difference, to produce the F1 generation. One of the F1 plants 
so the babies, um, is crossed with a pink flowering parent, so that's little p, little p, to produce the F2 offspring. So which one of the following is correct? Phenotypic ratio of the F2 generation. So let's do that cross. Now, according to Mendel's law of dominance, when a parent with a pure breed homozygous trait, dominant trait, is crossed with a pure breed homozygous recessive trait, all the offspring will look and appear and, and, and phenotypically be like the parent with the dominant trait. Okay, so here are our gametes. Okay, this is just an abridged Punnett square. So the F, this is my F1 generation, is going to be capital P, lowercase, capital, lowercase, capital, lowercase, capital, and lowercase. But now we are going to take these offspring, okay, okay, so this is F2, and we're going to say, right, we're going to cross the offspring with the pink plant, which means the pink parent plant, we're going to end up with capital P, lowercase p, lowercase p, lowercase p, capital P, lowercase p, lowercase p, lowercase p. So this would equate to 2, two out of 4, capital P, lowercase p, and 2 out of 4, lowercase p, lowercase p, and 2 is 1, and that is 2, and this is 1. And that is 2, so it is a 1 to 1 ratio. And there is my answer, okay? So I'm going to have, for every 4, I'm going to have 2 heterozygous and 2 monozygous recessives. So instead of 2 to 2, it becomes 1 to 1. It's certainly not any of the others. Okay, which one of the following scientists discovered fossils of Homo sapiens, that's us, but clearly dating back a lot, and Ardipithecus. Now, only one of these ever found Ardipithecus. Raymond Dart, Lee Berger, and Louis Leakey all found um, and I, I, I've just gone completely um, no, Australopithecus SPs. That's all of them. They looked at Australopithecus. Australopithecus. Okay. And only Tim White looked at Ardipithecus. So the RDs were all his bubbas. Okay? So. Tim White is correct. Please make sure that you know which of the popular fossils the different chaps found because they like to add it into exam papers. Now, the diagram below compares characteristics of wild sunflowers with sunflowers that have been artificially selected. Now, remember, artificial selection is just a way of, of nudging evolution a bit, okay? Um, you're speeding up evolution. And we, artificial selection is for traits that suit man. So it, it's to satisfy the needs of man, and it's not natural. So what have we got here? We've got wild sunflowers, and we've got our artificially selected sunflowers. So what's the difference? Well, here you can see that with the plant height, these are shorter. So being tall was not a, um, a selective process. The flower diameter, bigger flowers, so here they decreased, there they increased. The number of branch, side branches, but here there's zero, so that was clearly inbred. And then the leaf area goes from 180 to 270 to 300 and 315, so this was increased. So if you look at what was required here, they, they wasn't keen but they, this was a trait that they wanted, and this was a trait that they wanted. So these were ones that were 
unfavorable or unrequired. Okay, not, they didn't want those. So let's see our answers here. Which one of the following, which of the, one of the following characters was found undesirable by humans? Okay, so what did the humans, the humans didn't want branches and they didn't want tall plants. So there's your answer. Okay, it was the ones that they decreased. Okay, easy peasy. Then, punctuated equilibrium. And before we even continue, this is what punctuated equilibrium looks like. And then you have, and then, oops, that's punctuated equilibrium. That's what it looks like. Now, punctuated equilibrium is just the speed at which, oh man, which evolution occurs. So it goes with a period of equilibrium and then you have a quick change and then you have a long period of equilibrium again and then you have another period of a quick change and so on. That is punctuated. So you've got equilibrium, quick change, equilibrium, quick change, equilibrium. So let's see. Evolution is always slow and gradual. That is correct, but it's not got nothing to do with punctuated equilibrium. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put a cross there because it's not related to punctuated equilibrium. Natural selection does not explain evolution. That's absolute nonsense. New species can appear quickly ah, over a relatively short period of time. There we go. That is what talks to punctuated equilibrium. But let's just check the last option. Artificial selection is the only mechanism that causes evolution. Absolute nonsense. It's not artificial selection because there wasn't artificial selection five, six, eight thousand years ago. Okay, nobody there knew about inbreeding and stuff like that. Okay, or using biotechnology to create new organisms. Okay, a group of students observed the long-term use of antibiotics and it resulted in the decrease of bacterial infections. I mean, a decreased control of bacterial infections. Now, from this observation, the students stated that so after the observations, they say antibiotic resistance in bacteria is caused by long-term use of antibiotics. Okay, that's reasonable. So this statement is, well, it's not a theory because they've actually observed it. So they, they did an investigation, so it's not a theory. It's certainly not the aim of this experiment or investigation. It is the hypothesis, and it's also not a conclusion. So your answer is C. They are making that statement. They're saying antibiotic resistance in bacteria is caused by the long-term use of antibiotics. And then they can put together an investigation that can either prove or disprove their, their, their hypothesis.